we need the wild salmon. If they're extinct, so are we. Tonight, an outbreak of sea lice in Clackwat Sound fish farms is now a threat to a whole generation of wild salmon. I think it's going to mean uh, lots of, you know, change for our families in terms of uh, kids being apprehended due to poverty reasons. A Manitoba MLA is ahead of the federal curve with her private member's bill aimed to help families in poverty. That's cool. I don't know what that means, but I will figure out what that means. And a proud parent of a transsexual son shares her story after her child opened up and came out to her. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. We start in British Columbia where a class action lawsuit has been filed against a social worker. The civil claim was filed in Vancouver yesterday. It alleges as many as 90 Indigenous youth were talked into independent living arrangements. Robert Riley Saunders, a former social worker with the BC Ministry of Children and Family Development, is alleged to have opened joint bank accounts with close to 90 youth in his care. He then is alleged to have stolen money from their monthly government support payments. According to the defendant's lawyer, some were left homeless and some were forced to return to the families they were removed from. I know that my peers in care deal with a lot of vulnerability and are in really sometimes exploitive situations while we're going through the system. So it's imperative and extremely important that social workers and the folks that are looking for out for our best interests are doing that with sufficient oversight and a real sense of uh, commitment to rules and regulation that honors what is in a youth's best interests and in their care plan. Meanwhile, the provincial government in Manitoba has unanimously approved a private member's bill to amend child apprehension laws to ensure no child can be seized simply because of poverty. Point Douglas MLA Bernadette Smith was behind Bill 223 to amend the Child and Family Services Act. Smith says she's heard too many stories about children being apprehended just because their family is poor. There are almost 11,000 children in care in Manitoba. Almost 9,000 of them are Indigenous. I'm super excited that this bill got passed in the House. This is something that uh, has been a long time coming. It's going to mean uh, lots of, you know, change for our families in terms of uh, kids being apprehended due to poverty reasons. And it's going to mean, like, families staying together and supports being put into, you know, making sure families stay together. An educational gathering called Rural Reconciliation held its first event in Warman, Saskatchewan today. Saskatchewan is the province where a Cree youth was gunned down by a farmer in 2026, or 2016. He was acquitted in the killing. The reconciliation gathering aims to address the strained relations in rural Saskatchewan between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. The committee was created last January in response to Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. They say their goal is to educate rural Saskatchewan residents on treaties and Indigenous history. The hope is to create better relations and understanding between communities in that province. I know for myself growing up there was always this um, bias that was, that was just unspoken, right? And until I educated myself and got to be involved with reconciliation, I didn't understand where it was coming from. And so I think we have to move past those biases, those preformed opinions, and the only way we can is by educating ourselves so we can see where we need to move forward and work on. And we want to hear what you have to say. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca, find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, several fish farms had outbreaks of sea lice. One of the companies that runs the farms says they're dealing with the problem and even shut down one of the farms. But some who live in the area worry that tiny parasites aren't just creating problems for farmed fish, they could affect the wild salmon in the area. APTN's Lori Hamlin has the details. Clockwood Sound is located off the west coast of Vancouver Island 
and is a beautiful area of inlets surrounded by ancient temperate rainforest. It's home to Skookum John. He's from a house at First Nation and runs his own water taxi and whale watching business. In my eyes, it's the uh, best place to be. I mean, the beauty here is amazing. I mean, you'll never find this anywhere else in the world, never. But Clockwood Sound has also one of the densest concentrations of open net salmon farms in British Columbia. Cermak Canada owns 15 farms in the area, and earlier this year, seven of those farms were infested with sea lice. The infestation worries Skookum John. Wild salmon's going to be extinct. It's hard to swallow that. We need the wild salmon. If they're extinct, so are we. They feed, they feed us, they feed the animals, and when the animals eat it, they take it into the woods, and what, they, what does that do? It fertilizes our trees. And what do our trees give us? They give us oxygen. Sea lice occur naturally in the wild, but in small crowded fish farms, the problem is multiplied. Under the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans regulations, salmon farms must ensure adult fish aren't infected by more than three active sea lice. But CIRMAC's monthly reports show fish were infected by up to 30 in April. Linda Sams is the Sustainable Development Director at CIRMAC Canada. She's also a biologist who's been working in aquaculture for 30 years. She says the outbreak was mostly due to unusually hot, dry weather that affected water quality. For the past 10 years in Tofino, we have not really had a sea lice issue like we saw in this last six months. In late August, CIRMAC voluntarily closed one of its farms. The fish were treated for sea lice using both hydrogen peroxide baths and the pesticide slice. But due to poor health, the fish were humanely euthanized. At the end of the day, the, the responsible thing to do there was to actually close that site down. It was a hard decision because it's a big business move for us to do that. But the problem with sea lice isn't just with fish in the fish farms. The infected farms are located on wild salmon migration routes, which can pose a serious threat to wild juvenile salmon on their way from fresh water to the open ocean. A new report from Raincoast Research and Living Oceans claims that 96% of juvenile wild salmon in Clockwood Sound this spring were infected with an average of eight lice per fish, some as many as 50. The report also states that sea lice in Clockwood Sound have become resistant to slice, the only pesticide approved to kill sea lice on Canadian fish farms. Skookum John fears an entire generation of wild juvenile salmon has been wiped out. Having these sea lice attack those baby fish when they're coming from the rivers, you know, 50 of them on there, it only takes one of those sea lice to kill a young fish. A house at First Nation, where John lives, has a partnership with Cermat Canada. The fish farm owner provides jobs and economic and social benefits to the community. But Skookum doesn't believe any benefits outweigh the possible consequences. Makes me pissed off and, you know, we never needed um, a company like this. In an effort to not have a sea lice outbreak in the future, CIRMAC has invested $12 million into a custom-built barge that they say will remove and capture sea lice using pressurized water. The new hydrolyzer will be used alongside slice and hydrogen peroxide baths and is scheduled to arrive in the spring. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Clockwood Sound. Two Native American women were among those elected in the U.S. midterm elections last night. We've got that story coming up after the break, but first, here's tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus nine and sunny for Fredericton, Charlottetown and Halifax, plus two and snow for Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Cartwright. In Quebec, minus eight with rain in Montreal, snow and plus four in Saguenay. Plus seven for Windsor and Toronto, six above for Sarnia. Minus three and snow in Thunder Bay, minus five with snow for Sioux Lookout. Minus 15 under sunny skies in Puckettawagan, snow and minus nine in God's Lake. Minus five with snow in Winnipeg, snow and minus seven in Dauphin. Minus nine and sunny and swift current. Minus nine with snow for Regina and Yorkton. Minus eight in Uranium City. Minus 10 in Meadow Lake. Welcome back. It was a historic night as two Native American women 
were among those elected in the U.S. midterm elections. Both are Democrats and helped their party and a record number of women candidates take control of the House of Representatives. It is just one of the storylines coming from Indian country during the U.S. elections. For more, we're joined by independent journalist Jenny Monet. Jenny, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. So what can you tell us about the two Native American women who were elected last night, one that uh, you have a bit of a connection with? Well, I, I have a connection only in that we're um, citizens at the Pueblo of Laguna. And, you know, as a journalist, we're supposed to be so objective, but I ha I'd be lying if I said there's not a little bit of pride, um, one, as an Indigenous woman, um, but two, as a citizen of the same tribe. So I just think um, there's there's an intensity around um, that kind of pride today in uh, receiving this kind of exciting news, these two women uh, now the first two women ever elected into Congress, in the U.S. Congress. How historic was that? Uh, and were there other historic victories last night as well? There were other historic victories. I think what's central to um, uh, the congressional victories of Deb Holland and Sharice Davids, though, is that uh, we heard today, particularly in some of the remarks from Deb Holland, and that she's really shifting an immediate focus to the issue on violence against Indigenous women here in the United States. Certainly not, um, you know, a, a unfamiliar issue for uh, First Nations uh, residents in Canada, but here in the United States, that legislation is just picking up. And what we also saw from the midterm elections last night was also the defeat of North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who had been seen mm -hmm. as kind of the lead champion on legislation to help curb this chronic rate of violence on Indigenous women here in the U.S. And so to have Holland come out from the jump and start uh, really embracing this issue and also giving a real nod to the fact that there's not just uh, Holland and Davids now in the Congress. You have two other Republican congressmen who will be joining, who are Native American, already uh, in the House. And so, um, you know, it, it, we have something to look forward to in terms of uh, what kind of policy could be shaped around this issue. Jenny, you were in North Dakota, and as many of our viewers might know, a law was passed prior to the election that kind of threatened the uh, Native American vote there. How did things turn out? Uh, remarkably. I think that um, the message, the big takeaway is try to take away Native vote and they'll turn out in record numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw um, record-breaking um, voter out tur turnout at precincts across Indian country here in North Dakota. Uh, at Standing Rock, I know that there were, um, the voter turnout was 50% more than what it had been in the previous election. Uh, at Turtle Mountain, they had something, uh, I believe the numbers were somewhere in uh, over 5,000. Um, were, were tallied in Rollick County, which oversees the precincts there for Turtle Mountain. I know that my time on the ground yesterday, I went precinct to precinct, and at Spirit Lake, they were still printing tribal IDs as voting was happening, which meant that people there were, were showing up, getting their uh, new IDs so that they could vote to meet the standards of this um, address verification voter ID law, and voting, and at that point in time, uh, more than 600 tribal IDs had been printed, and half of those had been cast as ballots. Um, so it's, it's remarkable, and I think that there's a sentiment here in North Dakota that, uh, you know, this voter turnout is just the start of really embracing um, a, a new voter movement across Indian country. Good stuff, Jenny. Uh, appreciate your coverage through all this and uh, for taking some time for us here today. Thank you, Dennis. With all the debate around child killer Terry McClintock's transfer to the Okama Ochi Healing Lodge, Ipitan's in focus discussed healing lodges earlier this afternoon. Are they effective? Should anyone be allowed to serve time there? And should victims' families have a say? Here's a couple of clips from the show. They have to have good behavior while they're in the institution. They can't be affiliated with any security threat groups. They can't have been um, breaking the rules while they've been in prison. Um, they have to demonstrate a commitment to working with us in addressing those root issues. And we very clearly lay out the expectations. 
They also have to be supported by their team in the institution, which includes their parole officer and other correctional staff. There's, uh, there are, I know there's also children living in that uh, healing lodge, you know, with uh, their mothers and stuff. So, mm. and this woman, she took a, uh, you know, was one of the most innocent among us, yeah, and stole her innocence and then stole her life. Yeah, in my opinion, I, 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 I just don't see how anybody can justify a healing lodge in that in that case. Other people, yes, I'm all for forgiveness. I'm all about empathy. I, I believe people change. But I mean, there are some crimes that you commit that you can't come back from. I myself, like I, after reviewing everything to do with these healing lodges, I do believe it is, it, it is a good situation for some people who warrant going back out onto the streets. Like uh, an example I gave yesterday, um, an accident where somebody accidentally claims a life but there was no intent behind it these people are going to feel remorse they're going to feel hurt on the inside as well they're going to want to change their lives to get back to society and these programs would help that out but when it comes to the heinous acts behind a like a, a monstrous killer it, of a child at that like how how does it how does somebody even remotely of this magnitude get into one of these facilities. Parents of LGBTQ kids share how they support them. That's coming up after the break, but first here's the rest of tomorrow's weather. Picking back up in northern Alberta, chilly and minus 14 in Peace River, minus 13 for Grand Prairie. Minus six in Medicine Hat, three below with the sun out in Calgary and Lethbridge. On the west coast, 10 in Tofino, rain and plus eight in Campbell River. Minus 12 in Fort Nelson, minus seven and snow for Dease Lake. In the Yukon, minus 21 for Dawson, minus 18 in sunny skies in Mayo. Minus 14 for Fort Liard and Trout Lake, minus 17 in Norman Wells. Snow and minus 12 in Saks Harbor, minus 11 for Politak with snow. Minus 20 in Whale Cove, 23 below under the sun for Cambridge Bay. Minus 16 in Clyde River, minus 23 in Resolute. Welcome back. Being a teenager is no doubt challenging. Questioning one's identity is often a big part of those years. But what does that mean for young people who are two-spirited and their parents? Willow Fiddler sat down with two parents recently to hear how they support their LGBTQ children. And full disclosure, Willow is related to one of the parents in this story. This is Angie Fiddler. She's a mother of three and a boarding parent for First Nations students in Sulaco. About a year and a half ago, Fiddler and her daughter Maya traveled up to Muskrat Dam First Nation to give a youth workshop on sexuality. And it is a really touchy subject to talk about because parents don't talk to kids about sexual health or sexuality, right? Muskrat Dam is a fly-in community about 450 kilometers north of Sulaco in northwestern Ontario. It's also where Fiddler is originally from. It was fun, um, but it was also something we were a little scared of to do. Two of Fiddler's children are transgender and pansexual. Muskrat Dam, like many First Nations in northwestern Ontario, has strong Christian beliefs. It was kind of hard for me to do because Muskrat Dam has one church. It's the Anglican church and it has one priest and that's my father. But it wasn't her dad she was worried about. He's supportive of his daughter and grandchildren. A majority of the communities up north are Christian, and they have very strong Christian views. And me and my daughter coming in to bring in this kind of stuff, that was kind of scary. Fiddler says her oldest child, Shauna, went through a major depression as a teenager. And that was really hard. She was very suicidal, and we didn't... I 
now. <laughs> For about two years, we didn't know if we were coming home to our child hanging. But we still had to keep on encouraging her. Like, Sean, you'll get through this, you know. Sean, we're in it together. But I would ask my father to come and pray. I'd ask my mother to come and smudge. And, you know, I would ask people to come and show their support to Shauna for, you know, to live. Eventually, Shauna came out of the depression and she graduated high school. Even though Shauna was going through personal hell, um, she also discovered who she was inside. And she came back, and then that's when she was like, I'm gay. And A year later, Shauna told her parents she was also transgender. Shauna is now Sean. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I don't know what that means, but I will figure out what that means. I had to teach myself a lot of things, and there's nothing in our history books for us to learn off of for what our people believed before uh, colonization and all that. Our people celebrated like five genders and they had two-spirited people and they how they held them in such high regard because they had so many gifts. The journey for Fiddler has meant losing a daughter and gaining a son. So she wasn't a she anymore, she was a he. So I had to learn that and I explained it to him that I'm grieving for my daughter. You have to give me time and you have to be patient with me. But I'm learning. I, w I will learn anything because I love you. Fiddler is determined to support young people like her children. I really had to go digging to read and learn about all this. And because of, you know, residential school and all that thing, um, parents don't really, can't really talk to their children. And that was my case. Like, my parents couldn't really talk to me about certain issues, like a lot of things, but, and one of them was sexuality. But she says it's all been worth it. I saw my child becoming more of who she was and therefore being more happier in this world. And then it, after coming out as trans, like, oh my gosh, like the transformation to how she was when she was 13, 14, 15, to after coming out as trans, I felt at peace because I knew my child was one and wanted to live. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Sulacout. Hmm. That's your APTN National News for this Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a happy International Inuit Day. Indeed. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Uh, you can watch this uh, APTN in Focus on our website, aptnnews.ca, or on our Facebook page. That's it, APTN on our Facebook page. Have a great night.